So first of all, thank you all very much for coming and thank you for hosting you and, and thanking Camille for, for initiating this in the first place. Uh, so it's, it's great to be here in Prague. It's such a beautiful city and, and such nice people and I wish I had more time to, uh, to spend here. But what I'm going to talk about today is a project called Newspeak. And because you've probably never heard of it, I'll, I'll give you a bit of background of where it's coming. I mean, I have slides from various talks that I've given about it, but usually these talks, you know, assume a background in an audience that I don't know what your background is, but it's probably different. So once upon a time, uh, I used to work on the Java language specification for a long time. Uh, but after 10 years or so, I had paid my debt to society. And uh, I, was, I, I managed to, to escape. So while I was at Sun, I was constantly, you know, uh, not just me. Uh, a, a lot of people who probably wouldn't care to admit it who were working in the sort of poor Java language area were always thinking, like, what if we could actually do a language that, that we wanted instead of, of this great beast that now has millions of users and you can't change anything and you have to worry about every compiler bug, who, who's it going to break, and so forth. And that's one thread. So, I, so I've been thinking about programming languages for, for a long, long time. Partly because, you know, I did my PhD in programming languages. I basically don't know anything else. Uh, but another thread of this is in April 2004, they released Gmail. Uh, actually, on April Fool's Day. And I got an, an invite. Back then, it was like the hot thing. I don't know if any of you you know, remember, but getting an invite to it because you couldn't just use it, whatever. So I had friends at Google and I got an invite and I used it for, and I was all excited because I said, oh wow, this is going to be great. Google will do ma mail. Finally, I'll have a good mailer. Still waiting. This is being recorded, isn't it? Uh, but it's, I've never found a mailer that, that I really like, but as they say, every mailer should turn into a Lisp system and that's probably why I don't like the regular mailers. But setting that aside, I used it for half an hour and I came to the conclusion that, you know, this should be done differently. Uh, really, it hit me, oh, this is very impressive that you can do all this in the browser, but you really want something else. You want something that can work both offline and yet have all the advantages of working in the browser. So you want something that uh, basically can, can be updated like a web application. So you're always getting the latest thing, but all the other, on the other hand, you want something that works like a native application and, and can work disconnected and so forth. And email may not be the best example because it's hard to email without being connected to something, right? Emailing yourself isn't that much fun. But lots of other app client applications are like that. So again, I started to think of, since everything I think about is language-based, I started to think about what a language that might address that would be. So some of this, these slides are kind of related to that, but I'll mostly talk about the language per se, but I just wanted to give you that, that bit of background. So uh, again, do I want to go through this? You know, we've lived through the age of the personal computer as a disconnected thing, which was a great new thing in 1978. And I remember that, I'm ashamed to say, or sad to say, or whatever. But uh, the point of this is that, uh, the problem with a personal computer as it was classically manifested by the IBM PC and Microsoft and so forth is that you had to maintain it yourself. You had to update everything yourself. Whenever there was a new, new software, you had to install it. And of course, it had no end of problems due to the fine quality of that magnificent operating system and, and all that, that they manufactured. So when it didn't work, you had to uninstall it and you had to you know, uninstall the viruses. And it was a, it's a huge nightmare. And most people couldn't really cope with that. And for, for some years, people who did, regular people, not people like here, but people who aren't computer people, right, have had a very hard time with these things, sort of maintaining it. It's like being your own plumber. You, you know, some people are good at it, but some people don't want to actually deal with all that or aren't, aren't able to deal with that. And if you look at, at a naive user of a PC, say, 10 years ago, they sort of expected this is how computers are. They're full of viruses. They, you buy them new and they run for a while and then they get slow and there's endless problems, right? And we've moved to an era that on the one hand gives us less control for us computer people, but most people are much happier with where basically you get this package deal, your phone, your tablet, someone's basically managing, Apple is managing it for you or Google is managing it for you. 
and you don't quite have the same control, especially on the Apple machines, but you, you don't have the ability to, uh, to plug in. I'm not saying this because Google versus Apple or anything like that. I'm much more likely to say something that will offend my employer than will offend Apple anyway. So that's not the point. The point is the user doesn't have to administrate this damn thing. It sort of manages itself. You, you buy, get it from an app store and then it updates and so forth. And the degree to which you have to do this has varied over time and it's gotten e easier to use over time. So I call this full service computing. And some of these slides are rather old, right? So the first talk of this nature I gave 10 years ago. So it, it, it uh, and that was sort of the idea that led to Newspeak was, okay, so what can I do for a programming language that'll make that sort of stuff easier? Uh, right, so this, this is things I've already said, right? Uh, we can go through this. We don't have to deal with installing your viruses and not installing them and so forth. Right, so this is really, these are examples of that. The web browser is another example, right? It's always up to date. No one asks you, can I have the version of the, of the Google homepage from three years ago? You know, you, you create a, a mindset where it's not possible for people to say, oh, I like the old way and I'll get it. No, there's no such thing. It's always the current thing. You don't have to deal with, with versions of applications from the user's perspective. Uh, and there are problems with that, uh, lots of problems with, with web software. Uh, it doesn't apply to some things, like the, the web browser itself, for example, can't be a web app. Uh, and they depend on good, fast, cheap networking, which, you know, this was probably, this slide is probably 10 years old, but in fact, even today, you know, most of the time when you get on a plane, there's no network, right? It's, it's expensive. And, and still, people need offline for various pieces. Or you roam somewhere you're traveling and it costs the earth to run your data. So from, from all these perspectives, you know, you, you, this leads to the idea that there's a problem with this web thing and it has to work offline. Uh, and then there's the cloud, which is another sign of times to come. Again, this idea that it's installed on some service. And the cloud is really... Uh, you know, there's all these versions of, of cloud, but it's really a reversion to this, right? This is a CDC 6600. This is the computer that I learned. Not, no, it's not the first computer I learned, and it's even worse, but it is the computer I did in undergrad school for my CS101. And there were terminals, and we were very lucky as introductory, you know, first year students in 1980 to actually get terminals. And they were 300 baud. And it's really cool, because you can see it. But anyway. Setting that aside, but it's basically time sharing. It's an idea from the 1960s. It's now it's called the cloud because it's been rebranded and, and made sexy, but it's basically the same thing. There are dumb client devices and there's a big computer somewhere far out. It used to be, you know, you are on university campus and there's this thing in a big, big room. And now it's a data center somewhere out there and it's halfway across the, the earth, but it's the same principle. And that's become more and more common, and, and that's sort of a, a, a the pendulum of history swinging again from the personal computer back, backwards toward toward uh, time sharing essentially. And uh, you know we really we really want to combine the advantages of both of these things. And uh, yeah, there are all these issues that I brought up again. It's like with a web browser, offline use. What do you do when this thing is down? Uh, and there's also the issue of you know this is. That computer has to do all the work for you in that case. That costs someone money. Eventually, arbitrage is the fact that can I get all these devices sitting at the edge of the network? Can I get someone to do this parts of these computation that are feasible to do on, on their phone or on their tablet or something? There's an inherent advantage of that uh, in terms of cost and cost of energy use and all kinds of things. And then mobile devices are, the, 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 again, the, the other you know, manifestation of this. So all of this is by way of background of the idea of a platform that makes it easy to build apps that will work the way you would like them to work, which is that they automatically update like a web page or like an app store or better than the app store. You don't want the thing telling you all this nonsense about I'm updating and do you want to update or you want this to, to just happen. So people have less to worry about and less to administrate with. And you want it easy to make, make it really easy to write these applications. And so there are a whole bunch of things in Newspeak that I probably won't have time to touch on that, that were designed to facilitate that, and a whole bunch of things that aren't done yet. 
because the Newspeak project had funding for about two years. And after that, uh, you know, the, the crash of 2008-9 came and all the money disappeared and it's been a hobby ever since. So that's just by way of background. Chrome OS is another example of this sort of thing. And yeah, you want something that, that lets you access the local machine, do everything, synchronize automatically both the program and the data. But, you know, I, I really want to focus on the language. I just want to give this as, by means of background as to, that I don't do a new language just to do a new language, even though it's pretty much all I do. It's, you know, there's a reason for this, and, part, and this is part of the reason. And in terms of lineage, the way I chose to approach this problem has to do with basically taking ideas mainly from three places. And Smalltalk is the, the biggest of these influences. And uh, Self, I don't know how many people know about Self. Okay, well, I guess what you'd expect. So Self was another language, again, with some Smalltalk lineage, but it was a prototype-based language. When you ask Brendan Eich what his influences for JavaScript were, he says scheme and self. Don't ask me how that ended up looking like JavaScript. But they were influences in the sense of, a, of a, unlike Smalltalk, self was prototype based rather than class based. And this is the symbol for beta. It's uh, from Norse mythology. It's the Mjölner. I can't pronounce that. It's Danish or whatever, but it, it's, it's Thor, the god Thor's hammer. And that was their slogan. This was done in Scandinavia. Uh, they're the people who invented object-oriented programming to begin with Simula, and Beta was the successor to Simula, and it had some really nice ideas. And all of these, you know, somehow I have uh, brought all this into Newspeak for various reasons. So it's a dynamic class-based language, and it has two properties that hopefully make it interesting, because as Alan Perlis says, if a language doesn't tell you something new, it's not worth knowing, right? which is the case with a great many languages out there today, and I will, since I am being recorded, I will not name names, but languages that don't really bring a lot of, you know, intellectual, you know, excitement with them. They haven't actually invented anything new. They are incremental tweaks to something else. There are several examples of that. But here there are some unusual properties, uh, one of which is that all names are late bound. And so what is a late bound name, right? It's like a virtual method call in standard OO, but this applies to everything. It applies to things like the names of classes. That, that makes things very interesting. And there's no global namespace at all, which is very, if you actually look at most programming languages, that's very unusual. And this, this helps a great deal with modularity. And we'll, we'll kind of try and, and make this more real in a moment. Uh, so, yeah, no names are late bound. Essentially, every time you mention a name, every, every operation, essentially, that happens at runtime is a, you know, if you want a method invocation. And it could be synchronous or asynchronous, which is one of the reasons we use the terminology message send, that small talk terminology, usually for synchronous method invocation, but it can potentially be asynchronous. And that's a translation into the more common jargon. But another way of putting it is you program to interface, not an implementation. That's a slogan that many Java programmers have heard. There's only this little problem that you can't possibly do this in Java because the language is not designed to facilitate that at all because there are many things you cannot represent through an interface, uh, starting with constructors and classes and all kinds of things. And the APIs, of course, are full of classes. And the type system recognizes the difference between an interface and a class, which means that you can tie your, your code to a specific implementation and not to its interface. And you say you shouldn't do that. Well, you shouldn't do that, but the designers of the system did that, say, with ref core reflection, creating a situation where, where they couldn't actually uh, do many of the things they intended to do with the core reflective package. But that's, you know, I have talks about that too. Uh, and, I, and I was there. I mean, I was, I was, uh, I spent, as I said, 10 years on, on the J Java language spec and the JVM spec. So, I'm comfortable. I, I, anyone who wants to challenge me on this is welcome to, but I know what I'm talking about. Uh, so one of the outcomes of this is that everything is an object, right? And you probably heard this. If you heard a Smalltalk talk, you've heard this. If you've heard Ruby, you've said, heard this. And in Smalltalk, that's a guiding principle. 
And this is an excellent guiding principle in the sense that it makes things uniform. Just as in functional programming, everything is a function. When you make things uniform, things compose. When you have this variation, oh, I have primitive types, I have this, I have that, everything becomes clunky. Right? It leads to the fact that you need seven implementations of every method and, and all kinds of things. But with Newspeak, it actually isn't the guiding principle. The guiding principle is that you are going through a procedural interface for everything. That implies that everything will be an object, because objects are the things that, that carry these procedural interfaces. Uh, this means, for example, that you can't reference any fields directly. Right? Because if you're going through a procedural interface, if you're going through an interface, right, it shouldn't have any fields. It's all method calls. And uh, that is the case in Newspeak, uh, where we basically we declare, we can, that doesn't mean we don't have storage or variables or whatever, you declare them, but you're not going to reference them directly. So you can, you can declare them this way, which means sort of think final field, whatever. It means that this field is not mutable. And that means that there's going to be an accessor method that will get you those results. If you write this, then that's a mutable field. That's your regular imperative thing. And that means there's both a getter and a setter method. And this works much nicer with a small talk syntax than it does with a standard you know, C, vanilla, Java kind of syntax, as we'll hopefully see shortly. Uh, that gives you this nice property of representation independence. Nobody cares how you represent internally your data. Not, none of your clients can tell because they're always going through the procedural interface. The classic example, you know, you have points. You decide to go from polar coordinates to Cartesian, vice versa. As long as you support x, y, rho, and theta, nobody can tell the difference as to how, what, what representation you're using. You can switch it. None of your clients will be affected. Also, none, in, in Newspeak, none of your subclasses will be affected. In fact, none of the code in your class will be affected, only the declarations of that representation, because nowhere do you touch those, those fields directly. Even in the class itself, every reference to that name is a late-bound method invocation. Every reference to any name is a late-bound method invocation. So that's kind of nice. And to some extent, we do something similar in other languages, like Dart, for example. Uh, but what's really important that, for example, we don't do in Dart is uniform reference. So that you can't tell whether it's a method or, a, or these kind of getters and setters. So if you have to need to replace it with a computation, the, the syntax of referencing it is identical, whether it's a method or not. And then, then it becomes really important that you have the right syntax, because nobody wants to write, wants to write a lot of extra parentheses, right? Uh, but again, the small talk syntax makes that really easy. Uh, so uh, it gets more interesting when you talk about classes. So in most languages, when you talk about classes or types or whatever, that's a pretty much a statically known thing. And if you need to change it, well, you'd better figure out how to change it. And this leads you to dependency injection frameworks and all kinds of mechanisms, because you want to abstract over that stuff. And yet, it really is a, a, it usually the language makes it such that this is an invasive change. Now here, uh, referencing any name is a late bound method call. That includes the names of classes. If you refer to a name of a class, you're really act calling an accessor method that returns the first class object representing that class. Which implies, of course, that classes are objects. But more interestingly, it implies that classes are virtual. So there are languages that have virtual classes. That's, that's the beta influence. Beta is the, the first language that introduced this concept. Virtual classes are like virtual methods. They're, Things that you can override. You can dynamically rebind them in the class hierarchy. So you have nested classes, but they're nothing like Java nested classes or God knows what, what horrors you may have been exposed to. They are laid bound properties. You think of these, of these classes as if they were a property of an instance. And you can change them. So if you need to manufacture, you know, whatever it is, points, you manufacture points by, by referencing point. But it's late bound, and in a subclass, you can override that and replace it with something else. And you don't know the difference. It's exactly like methods, except it carries on to, cla to, to classes, which means it carries over to, to constructing new, new data, uh, new objects. 
right? And there's very interesting things you can do with that. It also implies that classes are always mix-ins. So a mix-in, does everyone know what a mix-in is? Okay, have we been going too fast? Is everyone baffled by why I'm, what I'm talking about? Uh, okay, we'll continue and hope for the best. <laughs> uh, so, in regular object-oriented languages, there's this notion of a single inheritance. I'm assuming everybody knows Java, right? Uh, and so, if you want to reuse code from a class, a definition from a class, but you want it in a different hierarchy, you want to tie it to a different superclass hierarchy, you can use copy-paste. That always works. That, 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 that's not the language that's doing that for you, right? You have to duplicate this code, and duplicating code is bad for all the reasons I'm sure you know. So that's not good. There have been over in, in ancient times. There's all kinds been all kinds of history about dealing this differently with multiple inheritance. So you have multiple superclasses, whatever. The, by the time Java came around, the conclusion was that didn't work very well, and they stuck with single inheritance. Right? Problem is. Suppose you, you, you had a function that took a, a, a superclass and produced a new class. Right? It's a function from classes to classes. You give it a superclass, it gives you a, a, a subclass back. And so this function would, you can imagine it looking like the definition of a class, except the superclass declaration is, is the formal parameter. Everybody with me? You're functional guys, right? You, you, you can do anything with a function. You, you, you believe in that stuff. So a mixin is basically that. A mixin is a declaration of a class where the superclass is abstract. It's essentially something you can swap in. So you can apply a mixin to different superclasses, and so that same piece of text that defines the subclass can be reused and applied to produce many different classes in many different hierarchies. Okay. Why does this work? Okay, so this is an interesting feature to have. You get it for free whether you wanted it or not once you make the decision that all names are late bound. Because that includes the name of superclass. So the superclass is not a static thing that is tying you forever to a particular hierarchy. It, you know, it's, it's a, essentially a, another virtual method call and you could override it and then produce something else from that class. Right? We give you a syntax to make that a little easier in speak, but basically you get mix-ins for free. You get virtual classes for free. All of which because you decided everything was going to be late bound. If you get late virtual classes for free, you get class hierarchy inheritance for free. So uh, to take an example, I assume, I assume everybody has some idea of JavaScript and the DOM and all these horrors as well. So people uh, make experiments with the DOM all the time. Uh, in the web community. They go off and say, well, maybe element, which is the top node of the DOM, should have some new functionality. So in JavaScript, you just shove something in the prototype for element and, you know, go from there. And that's, that has pros and cons, shall we say, but one of the pros is you can actually do it. If you actually want to do this, the alternative would be, imagine that the, the Java was a language of the browser, as, as Java sort of tried to be in, in, in you know, what made Java famous was applets back in 1995, was basically the fact that something would run in the browser. What would you do then if you wanted the, the top of the GUI hierarchy to be different? Well, you'd build your own copy of the browser. You'd get, take this thing. Do you, do you know how long it takes to build a browser if you have the source code? Let, let, let alone the fact that then everybody who wants to experiment with your, with your variation now has to go off and get your copy and your build. And, you know, it, it isn't going to happen. The, the flexibility of JavaScript is key to its success. Whatever its flaws are, that flexibility is, is absolutely key. The question is, can you do this in a principled way, as opposed to just bang, prototype? And so class hierarchy inheritance works this way. If you define the element hierarchy with all the, the various nodes of types of the DOM as a class hierarchy, which it isn't in JavaScript, obviously, but if you represented it that way, you could, define a, you could define this whole hierarchy in one class, one enclosing class, and then you could subclass it, and all you'd have to say is, I'm defining element to be a class that extends super element, plus whatever change I wanted to do, right? You, that is the, the strength of inheritance is that you easily represent differences from something that already exists. It has pros and cons like everything else, 
but it is very, very powerful at telling you, I want everything to be the same except here, I'm overriding this or I'm adding, add, adding that. And just as you can do it with an individual class definition, you can do it with an entire library that is represented as a class hierarchy because that whole class hierarchy is represented as nested classes in something else and that whole thing can be subclassed and overridden because all the classes are late bound exactly the way the original thing is. Does this make any sense at all? Okay, good. Well, at least if I get one person, that's good enough. Okay, we still have this gadget, right? So the other thing is there's no global namespace. Uh, and so that basically forces you into nested classes, right? Because you can't write something referring to something else. A class in Newspeak, a top-level class definition, doesn't see any names. It's, you know, it's like a lambda with no free variables. It doesn't see anything. There are no imports. There are not, there's no mechanism to let you talk about the rest of the world and therefore tie yourself statically to the rest of the world, right? Everything that a class in Newspeak is going to talk to is going to have to come to it from the outside, essentially as parameters. You can do all this with, by the way, with functions uh, if you wanted to. If you had record types and a functional language, you can do it all with pure functions. Uh, you don't have to do classes if you guys don't like classes. But uh, it, it's a matter of, of, of these key things not having the global namespace and making everything parameterized. Essentially, every Newspeak top-level class is completely param parametric with respect to, to the environment. There's a few caveats to that. It inherits from class object, and there's a handful of methods that it might get there. What do these methods do? They do things like give you basic types like string, because string, remember, is not some hardwired thing. String is the name of something that is late bound. So it has to be a method somewhere that you can get at, and that's what we use class object for to give us some, some basic functionality. But nothing else, everything is parametric. So you don't do dependency injection in Newspeak, at least not in the conventional sense. You don't need to do dependency injection. Everything is parametric by definition of the language. So when you create an instance of one of these top level things, you will have to provide parameters for anything that is depending on outside itself. And we'll, we'll look at code eventually, and maybe, maybe that'll click for more people. So in that sense, it's a natural modularity solution. So everything works with classes, right? It's classes all the way down. There are no million, the number of terms that languages have for these various attempts to modularize them is an indication that, you know, these solutions aren't very good because every new language tries to do something slightly different with them because none of them really work very well. So packages, modules, bundles, I don't know if anyone has ever seen OSGI or some, you know, Right, you, we, don't, uh, we don't do those sort of things. So if we're going to talk about that, I'm thinking when, when is the time to start actually demoing things instead? Right, well, we'll talk a little bit more and then we'll demo something. Uh, and yeah, maybe, maybe you should uh, ask more questions or something because um, I, I'm not sure how, how comfortable you guys are with this terminology and things. So again, a top-level class, a class that isn't nested in anything else, that's essentially the, the definition of a module. And uh, as I said, you can't get at anything else, so all its dependencies have to be listed explicitly. Essentially, the parameters to the constructor for that class are its connection to the outside world. Those basically give you your external dependencies. Uh, the other property you get from this is essentially sandboxing for free, right? This, this thing has no connection to the outside world except what you're passing to it. It can't go and call a native method. It can't, you know, do reflection. It can't do anything unless you gave it something that the capability to do that. So it go, fits perfectly with, which, with what's known as object capabilities, which is basically this idea of representing capability-based security and capability-based access simply by objects. If you have an object that knows how to do something, you can do it. And if you don't have this object, there is no way. There is no global namespace where you can just figure out the file system. If you want to write to the file system, someone will have handed you a piece of code that knows how to talk to the file system. There is no, by default, you know, whatever, name your favorite language, dot intro, dot io, dot whatever, 
standard package that is there for convenience and therefore anyone can always muck with it. This, this code is completely isolated. Okay, so that's another interesting aspect of this. Obviously that means that, you know, this whole thing is a class, it has an interface, you can implement it in different ways and you can run them concurrently uh, in diff with multiple implementations, right? The classic Java explan examples are like logging frameworks. You know, this guy needs that logging framework, this one or the other. They can't do it, they start doing class loaders and OSGI and if you know about how this is stuff is done, then, then you should understand how horrible that is and if you don't, you don't want to know. Uh, right, and they can all, yeah, they can, they can coexist, right, because it's just like objects. It's, different, it's instances of the same interface, possibly by a different class or implementation, and they can be there, they can be their first class, they can be stored, they can be passed around, and, and really there's no real restriction on them. So all of this is kind of nice. Uh, okay, we're going we're gonna to look at real code instead of this uh, slide where I think it's, it's about time to do that. So somewhere, let's see if you can, showing up, okay, so that's the, this is the Newspeak programming environment, and again, it's, it's very, in a way, it's very small talky. We don't use the same browsers, if you watch Steph's Pharaoh talk, no, not, we have, we don't have a lot in common in terms of the actual environment, because for various reasons we decided to, to, to modernize and, and not use the browser design from 1976, which was a brilliant design in its time and still a lot better than most of what people use with, with text editors or, God forbid, Eclipse and, and its ilk. But, you know, brilliant in 1976 does not mean that you could not possibly do better. So anyway, uh, you know, this is a workspace. It's interactive. Uh, there's liveness. We, we may try and, and do that sort of stuff and, and show you, because uh, that's another thing. This language is in the small talk tradition, and it's very important that we maintain things, uh, that, that feeling of, of interactivity and liveness that's, that makes small talk so addictive to, to its users. Right? It, it has all that, but I want to talk about modularity, so we'll go find something that kind of illustrates this. Uh, what is it? Let's say. Because I haven't, since this is really, uh, yeah, let's look at this. This is a namespace for combinatorial parsing. So we have, we have, we use parser combinators. I'm sure at least this is one thing this audience is probably quite happy with the concept parser combinators. All of you know what that is, right? You're functional programming people, I was told, right? Okay. So it so happens that new, the, the Newspeak environment uses a uh, parser combinator based uh, parser in the environment. We actually use it. We don't write papers about it. We use it. That's, that's a little unusual, right? And this is essentially the library that implements that. So it's called combinatorial parsing. It's just a class. But it has a bunch of nested classes for the various, you know, essentially corresponding to the different uh, kinds of nodes that you'd have, right? So alternation in the grammar, there's alternating parser, there's a parser for basic characters, there's, uh, you know, there's uh, things that are optimizations like a comment parser that you could do out of more primitive things, but we do want the thing to work at some reasonable speed. Uh, there's the empty parser, right? All of these things, if you, if you, if you know about parser combinators, you, you can see where, where these things are going. So they're nested classes inside a larger class so I've got a whole library, a parser combinator library, a class library because it's class-based language, and all of it is basically in one thing that's a module that is one top-level class, and these guys are nested in it, right? And uh, if we look here, right, these guys. I don't know if, yeah, that's the problem with this setup, but uh, see these guys, right? So these are effectively our imports. If, we, if you look at the top line there, it says class common. Can everybody read this? I'm not sure if everybody can read this in the back. Right, maybe we can try and, and zoom in a bit. A little bit bigger. That might help slightly, right? So 
it says class combinatorial parsing, and then it uh, using platform colon platform. So the small talk syntax, which some of you, I, you had a small talk talk, I guess, sometime in the past year or so, so you probably don't remember the syntax, but essentially using platform colon platform, that's, a, that's a, a method header that says that the name of the method is using platform colon, and it takes one argument. The colons always mark the arguments. It's sort of a keyword-like thing. So this is essentially the factory method, or what you'd call the constructor. Right, so if I want to create an instance of combinatorial parsing, I'll have to call that and pass it an argument. Not always, but very, very commonly, these top-level modules take an argument, which typically we call it platform, because it, it is an object that represents the platform. Remember, these things have no names, access to the external namespace. There is no standard prelude. There is no nothing that they can talk to you give it a platform object that gives them the core libraries that they need to use. That means, yeah? Question, is there any side effect access internally? Like, how would you write a clock in this? Uh, you talk to, you, you might need primitives, but you would basically uh, be able to side effect the platform or, or talk to it or, or read. You need to get the native, right? You need to have some module that has native connection to the operating system to tell you what the time is, right? which means that not everybody can write it or not everybody can mess with the operating system. You'd have to give it. Now, the, the, the point being that the, what platform you give it depends on what, it, what you need it to do. You don't always have to give it the full platform. If you don't want, want it to write to the file system, you don't give it a platform object that has the full capability to write to, to, the, to the file system. You give it a, an object that attenuates this. And therefore, you know it can't write to the file system, or it can't use reflection, or whatever particular capability you don't want it to have. Oh, that was great. Ah, OK, so this is what happens when you turn off presentation, and now you get to see that it's not so great at refreshing things, is it? Uh, so this is not going to work very well. Hello. This is one way to get it to show us everything, but this, yeah, it's kind of, uh, this is, so, so there's a lot of background. We're, we're, we're piggybacking on Squeak Smalltalk. We also have an implementation that puts out JavaScript, but that doesn't have the full IDE in it and so forth. So that means that we live with a lot of quirks. So I'm going to stand here anyway and hope that uh, you, know, you guys can see this, because that way I can keep this thing alive by tickling it periodically. Uh, right? So. I can, I can, if I want to test things, I can give it a mock object. And the thing is, I don't have to have, to have a, you know, a, a software developer with 10 years experience to do this who knows that they should set up things that will help them and they have to go a lot of trouble and choose which dependency injection framework they're going to use and all this thing. You can't do it any other way. This is the only way you can actually code. So that that in sort of, it enforces modularity basically by, by syntactic structure. Then, okay, so how do I actually get at anything inside here? Uh, these guys that are shown as slots, let's expand this so we actually see the, the source form. So that's not so you can see all the nice comments, but this is pretty idiomatic. What happens here, this is the, essentially the body of the constructor, if you will, of what we call the factory method. And what it's, it's got a bunch of, of instance variables, what we call slots. And as you notice, they use an equal sign, so that means they're, they're immutable. We, and yeah? Sorry, are operators also uh, laid down? Yeah, yeah. Their operators are just things with weird names. But this is a declaration syntax. This is not e the equality operator. This is literally a declaration of a field, so it's not that same equal, right? And what we're saying, okay, we need ordered collection, which is like array list or whatever you want to call it. It's a, a sequence of stuff, right? We need that class. We get it, the platform, we send, we call, again, there's no dot. If, you, if you're used to the standard syntax, you can imagine a dot here. But since the only operation is method call, there's no real point in having an operator for it. It's implicit. It's like function application in a functional language. It doesn't need an operator. That's all there is. And so we ask platform for the collections library. And we get an object back that is an instance of the collection library. And of course, we could have several, but the platform has a standard one. And we ask the collection library for the ordered collection class. And we assign it to an instance variable here in the top level module, so we'll have access to it in the rest of the body. Because this parameter isn't in scope in the rest of the body, so 
I don't actually get it willy-nilly at anything that, that, they, that someone passed me everywhere. If I want it, I basically extract it and list it here. And that means that I have all the external dependencies that I want, that I'm relying on, are here. And I know that I can't get at anything else. So that's kind of nice. So, so we know that all this thing actually uses, all we actually needed in order to do this parser combinator library was we needed you know, maps and lists, which otherwise might be standard in a lot of languages, but we're getting them from the library. We need maps and lists, and we need some reflection. We get this particular ref class object mirror that, does, that reflects objects, and we have, we have reason to use it. But that's, that's a different talk as to how, how we, you know, the neat tricks we play with that in order to use it. The point is, this thing is some completely self-contained. These are its external dependencies. And of course, I can create five instances of these if for some reason I want them. Or I can have different implementations as long as they actually maintain the interface that is dictated by you know, whatever classes we have here. Right? So maybe this, this makes what I was talking about earlier more concrete. Uh, if I try to reference something inside one of these guys, let's like open a nested class, find a method. Just for the hell of it, I will, uh, hello, wrong button. Let's say that I decided to look at sets. I said set new, right? So it's unhappy with set because set isn't in lexical scope. And that's my sign that I've probably forgotten. And if I really needed set, that probably means I need to go up there and, and implement or import it. And, and with a little bit of polish in the ID, yes, we could have a tooltip that said, would you like to import this, blah, 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 right? We really should, but it's volunteer work, so it doesn't happen. Is this code manually, or is it generated from the EBM app or something like that? This is, uh, so this, this is the library. This is right. handwritten code. Now, what, what, an, what, a, what a grammar looks like, I can show you. It's sort of a little, well, you might find it interesting, though it's a little beside the main drift of the talk. A grammar uses, okay, so let's, let's uh, we might as well talk of something that people are actually interested in. That can happen, too. Uh, well, maybe it's just me, it's Well, that's already one more than I had before. <laughs> uh, so uh, the root of this hierarchy is called combinatorial parser. It has operations like and, and, uh, okay, hang on, we need to. I need to slide here, sorry. Uh, this is not, usually there's a, de I mean, this, this setup is a little weird, uh, in just in terms of, of managing a presentation, sorry. But we have here basically operators. So um, which are ones that might actually make sense? Hello, I didn't mean to do that. Okay, it's too small for the screen. So like, for example, plus, right, that's the, you know, the usual one or more repetitions, right? We can actually look at its definition, right? So it basically produces a node that represents. What, what happens here is the way the library runs, you basically create an abstract syntax tree representing the BNF and you interpret it, right? The first time. So when you write a grammar and you say, you know, you have the name of a production and you send it the message plus, it's going to create a node representing that and you'll and, and the grammar will basically by executing the grammar one time you will get a, a tree that you can then interpret and then potentially compile if we wanted to optimize it and make it faster but you know it's mostly fast enough for us because we're met, all we do is, is parse little methods like this most of the time it shows the maturity of, of, as well you know, having this having the going from bnf to, mm -hmm. to this is very impressive so, so, a, if, so you can imagine, well, I'll show you what an gr actual grammar looks like, but I think at, at least you've gotten the idea, uh, and hopefully a few others, uh, right? But um, another it's... Another stage left question, while I'm thinking yeah. of it. Is everything pass, there's no pass by reference here. So uh, you've got incredible memory usage going on. Uh, pass by, okay, this is, this is the, the model is the same as in Smalltalk or in Java, right? I mean, all these arguments are pointers to objects, right? There, there are no explicit pointer types, right? Every name, but, but, we, but uh, you're, you're just doing what, what Java or Smalltalk does, OK? Uh, right, so that was a little aside on this. And I'll, I'll show you a grammar that uses this somewhere. But it's, it's just a nice, it, it's easy. I used to have an example where I had this 
historically this was split into two classes so I could actually demonstrate class hierarchy and st inheritance with it but we decided that for that particular example it was stupid so we, we unified it so it makes less of a good example but it makes more sense uh, <laughs> so essentially all the operators are operated on these grammar on these uh, parser objects and they produce other parser objects and you build up a tree when you describe the grammar all of which is somewhat Slightly irrelevant to the main drift of the talk, but that's okay. Uh, uh, okay, private. So, yeah, so we have access control uh, because, again, remember I told you, you know, that it's that it's sandboxed and that these things are acting as capabilities. What does that? What does object capability mean? Object capability means that if the object has properties and if you have the object, you can get at those, and if you don't have it. You can't, but the object also has implementation details inside it that you don't want to expose. If you're, if you're at all serious about making security, these objects have to have a notion of privacy. This is not like privacy in Java. This is, you have private, we have three levels of privacy, but basically you want to have per object privacy so that if, an, if the state of an object can only be accessed or the representation of the object, it's not a, at all essential that it has state at all. This can be purely functional. Uh, but the internals of the object can only be accessed by the object itself. Right? So you want to mark your methods whether they're public, so anybody can call them on the object. If they're protected, actually only the object can get at them. If they're private, that means that only the lexical definition they're in can see them. And that serves not a security purpose, but a software engineering purpose. Because if it's private in that sense, if you decide to add it, erase it, whatever, no one else will know. It's local to, to your lexical definition, to your module. Does that make any sense? And so when we're talking about these, these, these slots are really there. They're, uh, they're an idiom for importing things, right? We're, these are things that we got from the outside world, and we need to put them in our namespace by having, you know, we put them in a variable. The variable means there's an accessor, so anyone can talk, say ordered collection, and they get the ordered collection class. And that's private because really no one else outside this piece of code, no one, has, no one needs to know what my external dependencies are. It's none of their business whether I use ordered collection or not. It's, you know, right? it's, it's not important to, to the API. So that's why these are private. But basically there is a notion of access control. And it has taken us a long time to actually implement this because Squeak has no concept of access control. right? And we need this access control to... Uh, we need this access control because if we're going to ever make this story real, then, then it really has to be enforced at runtime. It isn't something that the compiler says yes or no. It really has to, to, to the runtime has to make it possible for you to have methods that you cannot call and methods you can't call. The Smalltalk runtime won't do that for you. Smalltalk runtime, all methods are public. All instance variables are essentially protected. And if you ever have something that needs to be computed, it has to be a method and it is public for all the world to see. And you rely on the goodwill of, of the nice small talkers around you not to get at that. Because small talk was conceived in this wonderful world to educate children and we're all friends long before the first computer viruses showed up and they know, had no idea what a crappy world they were bringing this thing into. So squeak as a basis for a secure environment is ridiculous. It is that you cannot find something less secure if you imagine it. Because basically in squeak or any real small talk, if you pass someone an object, you're passing them, not only can they muck with the interior of that object, they can go get the class of that object, change that class, and change all the instances of that class anywhere, whether they had a pointer to them or not, reflectively. Which is great in your development environment and lets you do really neat tricks and fix and continue debugging and all kinds of wonderful things, but a security story, it is not. And so there are things we have to do differently. Yeah? Is the access control dynamic, is it changeable, mutable at runtime? What's, okay, it's mutable reflectively, okay. right? So you can change any program reflectively if you have access to mirrors, which are the re reflective capabilities. So in the development environment, you can change it all, but the idea is no, you, you won't be able to muck with it at that point. Right. So what will happen if you have a massive class? Mm -hmm. see right, so this is lexically scoped, essentially. I mean, that's one way of thinking of it. So these things are seen. It's ALGOL 60 rules. I have not seen better ones. It basically means everything that is lexically, these nested classes are lexically scoped. The environment doesn't show you a, flat, a file. If 
but I can spit out a file. Unlike Smalltalk, I can f spit out a file with real syntax where this is nested. So all of these things are lexically nested in that scope. And yes, they see the things in the surrounding definition, but not vice versa. So if there's something private in alternating parser, char parser cannot see it. Okay, so it's strictly object encapsulation. So far, so good. Okay, so we kind of. Okay, so the, think of the period as a semicolon, and when you see a semicolon, it's not. It's it's something else. Uh, the, the only thing I will point out, they were there first. They when they invented their wacky syntax, curly braces were probably weren't there yet. This dates to the mid 70s. Uh, the period's closer to the return phase. Well, I don't know. You need to look at an alto keyboard. <laughs> right, so it's a statement separator. Yeah? I have a question. So if we pass platform as a parameter, yeah. can we change it from the inside of this class? Like, can we, for example, redefine collections property of platform? So that depends what you, what, how you wrote your platform object. But no, we're, we're stupid, but not quite that stupid. OK. okay so. Essentially, this is the advantage of having, essentially, from the outside, the only thing you're getting on an object are method calls. There are no fields. You have no access to the representation. The only thing you can change about it is if it has methods that allow you to change it. So platform basically has a bunch of, of accessors that give you individual libraries, like collections and graphics and mirrors and things like that. And these, in turn, give you access to individual classes. And if you are an idiot and write your library so that they can muck with it, yes, they can. But the idea is that, that you actually design stuff. But that's a, that's a good question. Yeah, you, you, it potentially, if you pass it a mutable platform, then you, you, you decide what, what capability you're giving this thing. Yeah? Um, what's your approach to mutual recursive modules? Is it possible actually without any side effects? Uh, it's possible. So, so there we have a mechanism for that. There's actually a slightly different syntax for, for that. If you want... Uh, Do you have a special feature for mutual recursive modules? Yes. Okay. Uh, and I'm not sure it's the right thing. So there's, there's two ways I can think of doing them. There's a way I actually wrote up in my PhD thesis 20 odd deep, more than God knows, a long time ago. And, uh, and there's, which is essentially, if you think of it, it's like the cake pattern in Scala. It relies on, on unifying self-reference. Uh, what we do here is different. Uh, we basically have a construct. So in terms of syntactic details, in small talk, local variables are defined be between a pair of vertical bars. So we reuse that syntax. You, can't, you can barely see it, but there's a vertical bar here and here. And basically, these are, these are essentially the instance variables are defined here. And there's a syntax with double vertical bars, which says these guys are actually going to be used for a mutually recursive definition. And behind the scenes, it creates futures to reference them. OK? And this is a mixed blessing, because the problem is you see these futures later on until they resolve themselves. And I'm not sure I'm thrilled with it, but it works. Yeah, yeah. OK? Does that make sense? But that's a very good question because it is, in my view, essential to a real module system that you allow mutual recursion. Historically, most module systems don't. Uh, a theory I heard from a prominent professor of computer science was they're all compiler writers. Compilers are one of the few cases where you can create a pipeline and you, and you don't need mutual recursion. So they foisted this on the world because it worked for them. Uh, whatever the story is, I find the idea of a module system that isn't mutually recursive that, that, that doesn't mean meet basic criteria for, for real modularity, in my mind. So yeah, we do. We do, do. Yeah. And then question. Yeah. Uh, you talked about only exposing interfaces of mm -hmm. objects and yeah. so on. And obviously, there's a problem with, let's say, binary operators. When, let's say, we have a sets and we have a, let's say, union, mm -hmm. you can obviously do it as a Right, binary uh, method problem. Checking, uh, let's say your interface is only uh, does the set contain yeah. element. Uh, so what's the right? So so basically, this is uh, one of our goals is to prove that this really works, and and maybe we haven't proven it right. Right. So object encapsulation. There's object encapsulation versus abstract data types. 
yeah. basically as, as fundamentally that, that's, the, that's the dichotomy. And most of the object, that all the typed object oriented languages do abstract data types. All the untyped ones just don't do access control and, and don't worry. So if there's ever a problem, you, you, yeah, it's supposed to be private or we didn't intend it, but you can still, you can still muck with it. Uh, the, in most cases, what happens is you lift the, the, the part that needs to be shared, you lift it to the enclosing scope. Now, that may not always be a perfect answer, but, in, but, but so far we've been able to do that. Okay, so you have two objects, and to implement some operation efficiently, you really, one object really needs to see the internals of the other, right? Uh, oh, okay, so okay, so uh, maybe we should do something just to make this concrete. Oh, interesting, we're running on battery power. If this goes rather low, remind me and I'll find a power supply for it. Uh, that also is why it keeps closing the damn screen so fast. Okay, so it would be good to, to plug it in somewhere. Uh, not sure where. But, okay, so let's, uh, let me do something here. I want to do, oh, I can't see, is that the option I want? Save the file. Uh, if you need the power for this, or I need the power for this, it's in here someplace. It's good someone's going to edit all this video because I'm sure the world is really interested in these uh, things. So we can kind of, if there's a plug somewhere, can go from there. Anyway, uh, what I just did, or thought I did, is I saved this to a file. And the reason I'm doing that is so I can show you the actual textual syntax. Being kind of in the Smalltalk tradition, we don't have a great interest in files and textual syntax. But unlike Smalltalk, we actually do have one for the entire program, because that's very important. And, but we just don't find it useful to edit it with, with the same paradigm that worked so well in 1965. Uh, so. Once I have that, I've saved it somewhere. Okay, cool, thank you. I, give me another few centimeters. And, okay, I think I'm good. Yes, okay, power, that's what everyone wants. Um, let's put this away. How do I put this guy away? Go away somewhere. And which directory were we running this in? Uh, Well, let's find a directory. You speak uh, dev. Uh, I have so many versions of this stuff. I think it will be here. Combinatorial parsing. Let's bring up Emacs. OK. So there's a file here in Emacs, right? And this is combinatorial parsing. There's some metadata, but basically here, class combinatorial parsing using platform, blah, 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 <laughs> right? As we go down the file, this was what you saw, the slot, the, the definitions of the, of the slots and everything. And then there's parentheses, for whatever reason. If I really wanted to be popular, I'd turn them into curly braces. Uh, but then this is essentially the class body. And in this class body, the first thing is, was alter, alternating parser. That's a nested class declaration. It's in here. It keeps nesting. It keeps going down. So we basically have these parentheses mark the body of the class. And there is a lexical scope here, so it nests. You know, whatever is textually nested, okay. so nested. So you would, let's say, implement some set operation class, then inside you would... Uh, so, so I would, so depending what you need to share, and, and sometimes it's a little awkward, but basically the shared data that you need to put, that, that has to be, that shouldn't be exposed in the object's interface yet, multiple objects need to get in, should be in lexical scope in their surrounding lexical scope, so they can both get at it but their clients cannot see it. And this is a challenge, right? This is why people chicken out of doing object encapsulation. This is why Dart didn't des decide not to do it, because no one, you know, there's a lot of academic papers in this vein, but no one's really done it to, you know, in, made a workable system and shown that, that you can live with this, right? Because Smalltalk basically makes all the methods public. Most of the other languages make everything public, and all the type languages use ADTs, in fact. So if you really want to take objects in that 
sense seriously that that object is a unit of encapsulation, which you need to if you're going to make it into a capability, then you need to do that. And the question is, how hard is that? Or should we start inventing new constructs, which is possible to, to support this? For the time being, since we've only gotten access control working recently and started to convert the library, I'm, I'm, I'm holding to, to the purest line, and we're going to see how it works out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you uh, define some super scope, let's say super class, right. and you define inner class, which would be carrier where for the set, yeah. where some internals. So, so set, the, the set class, say, would be a nested class. Okay. So two instances of set can still not see their internal representation. And so you would typically like to have something that, uh, a weak map in the enclosing scope. So the collection library has class set. Inside the collection, the collection library is an outer class. Inside it has class set. In collection library, at the level, at the same level that the class set is, but not inside class set, there is a weak map that is keyed by set objects and points at like internal objects that they need to get at, which is like representation objects. And then you basically access this, you know, keyed by yourself or keyed by the other object you're testing equality for, and you get at the representation. How common is this? How important is this? How awkward is this? Can we give a syntactic sugar for it? These are open questions, but like I said, I'm going to do it the pure way and see, you know, how much does it bother me? But, but this boils down to object encapsulation versus ADTs. So does that now, you, you may think I'm crazy, but, but does it, do you understand what I'm trying to do? Yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, anyway, this is what the syntax looks like. And in a language like this, what we found was you've got an awful lot of nesting going on. And even in existing languages, right, if all these things telling you this curly brace matched up with that curly brace, did I do it right, did whatever, this is a royal pain. That is why it is much more pleasant to work with this with, uh, with this guy. Sorry? Uh, okay, it's, uh, I think this works better. So, right, so, so this, this, this browser you're seeing, it's a structured view. This is another pet peeve, not only of mine, but the whole small community, they, they don't even have, they can't even, you know, they don't even have files. They, they built this, the, the system is, is, most of the small talks are still using an interface that was conceived, I think, before the, there wasn't even really a notion of file on, on, on the Alto uh, in, in, in the user space, right? It was all objects. In any case, they, it's a structured view. If you think of it in any other domain except programming, people use a structured view of their data with a UI that makes it convenient. Only programmers insist on working at the lowest possible level of abstraction. To me, it's like, why can't I see what sector of the disk this stuff is on since I really you know, might as well know exactly where, where things are? We use a structured representation, and it works like a web browser, right? These are links. I can go here, I can go back, uh, I can do various things with this. I can open it in place, actually, as well. If, if it's a small thing, it's convenient to open it in place. Uh, I, I have navigational tools. When I edit a method, let's go back to one of these guys, and I look at this method, right? I'm editing right here. I don't have to worry whether my curly braces align with something else and mess them up. It's a structured view. I'm only editing this method at a time. That has all, as an aside, it has all kinds of advantages. So when Microsoft wants you to do their fancy things in Visual Studio, they have provided you with an API that tells you which part of your file is actually visible on screen now, so you don't have to parse everything and process everything, because that'll be too slow when you're doing sort of interactive features for your extension of the ID. This is taking an easy problem and making it hard. We know what method we're editing, thank you very much. No one can edit it anywhere else. And we're done. We know that we only have to parse this. We can afford to use a, a, a naive interpreter for parser combinators to parse this and colorize it and every keystroke recolorize it with parser combinators because we don't have to go through 10,000 line files all the time and we don't have to go through some convoluted API telling me where it begins and where it ends and all this. If you define, th if you structure things cleanly, problems get simpler. I think you may have heard of this notion because you're into functional programming. 
So the Smalltalk IDE is different for, for good reasons. It's just a more sensible way of rather than having a, the common denominator of raw text. In particular, when we have all this nesting, it's even more important to do that. So just uh, as, as background, and uh, we can now go back to our scheduled program. Sorry. So yeah. if you keep this in the version control system, mm -hmm. how do you see the difference between like past provision and present one in this program? Okay, we don't have internet, do we? So I can't demo it. But, but okay, so what happens here? Yeah, we do. Uh, okay, well, we can try and connect. What, what do I connect to? And we can try and see if it works. Uh, Locus anything. Five gigahertz is faster. Up, up. No, that was wrong. It's not this one. Locus anything. Okay, somebody knows. You have a cable. Oh, sorry. Come again. You're you're recording this for all the world. You know that. <laughs> okay. Yes, that I get. Okay. Yeah, okay, yeah, well, I guess they'll, they, if they have to break in, okay, so now maybe we'll be able to actually demonstrate this. Uh, so, let's go to, okay, so let's see what we can find. Of course, I may not have changed anything, so there may be nothing to see. And, yeah, there isn't anything to see, so let's change something. Uh, let's go back here. Uh, not here, back to, uh, let's just add a method, a useless method, just have it there. Okay, so I've added plus two. Now I believe that if I go back to here, apparently we have added plus two. Okay, so what happens here is, because we have a textual syntax for the entire compilation unit, which Smalltalk does not have, we can use, it's easy for us to use standard source control behind the scenes. But because we like Smalltalk and we like the culture and we don't think that using a lobotomized command line interface designed by people who, whose gift for human communication is beyond belief uh, is a good idea, we actually want, again, a structured view. We don't want some random thing that deals with text to tell us, you know, somewhere on this line something changed. We can tell that a particular method wa was added or a particular class was added or removed or a particular slot, right? We can get a structured view of the diffs. And that's what we do. And in our opinion, it's the only civilized thing to do, of course. But, of course, if you prefer to say git dash blah blah, right, there's a rich scope for all the wonders it can do, and it's very fast and all things. This is dog slow because after git does its thing in no time, we off have to parse it and whatever with our parser combinators. So, you know, this isn't, this could be engineered to, to run a little faster. Just a little bit. Well, then yeah. Uh, they, they go in here. Uh, let's see. I, actually, this, this is something Ryan fixed and finally solved not so long ago. But basically, it's all objects. So, you know, it'll show you a namespace and it'll show you that there are like images and pixels. Somewhere I should be able to find some of these things. Uh, but that's, that's the sort of the mechanics that I don't know. Let me think of what's a good namespace that might have things in it. No, that's old. We were getting rid of it. Okay. So what is that namespace? What do you mean? Basically, I mean from this is purely an IDE construct. Okay. It's not a language construct. So, so, but, but it is relevant to the discussion of modularity because okay. So so far, I've told you it has no global namespace. Whatever. At some point, somebody's going to have to instantiate the thing, right? You have to stand on something somewhere. Uh, so, really, everyone has to do that somewhere. Usually, they use the file system as their final crutch. If you have make or, or anything, you're referring to names, and, and the file system is keeping your namespace for you. We basically use the IDE as the namespace. 
So eventually, if I want to instantiate combinatorial parsing with a platform object, or some of them take other things and need to compose with other modules, I need to refer to these things. I have to find what, what pieces I'm using, and they don't, the language doesn't have a notion of a global namespace, so they don't, their names are nowhere. I mean, those names are there essentially in the class. The class name is there for reflective purposes and debugging purposes, so I can identify it, but there's no way to directly refer to it. And so I have essentially just you know, maps in the, in the ID that give me, you know, things and they can be organized in different places and you can duplicate things in different places as is convenient. And then I should be able to pass such a map object to code that will then read things out of it and, and put the things together. And I can, can show you how it's done. So some of these in the namespace will have actual other things like, yeah, pictures or resources, but I have no idea where he put them, uh, so I guess kind of believe me they're there and, and uh, if you really want to know send me an email and, and I'll eventually find it. But uh, I think that's what these, these letters, they're new, I think that's what he put them in for to identify different kinds of things. So P is, I, I'm guessing program, but I just made this up, I, I don't know why this is, uh, a lot of the hacking on the system is done by Ryan Macknack, who's also an engineer on the Dart VM team, but does fantastic work, and he's also the prime contributor to, to Newspeak open source, and by now he's motoring on his own, and I can barely track what, what's happening. Uh, so these are all very good questions. They're rather advanced questions in the sense that source control and reason, all these things are, are not core to the language, right? But they're, they're actual real things that one has to deal with. And we find that, again, that objects give us a very unifying framework for dealing with all these things in, in a standard way. Uh, so what else can I tell you that's actually interesting? So this is kind of the core of the modularity story. So I can show you how an app is done, if, if that's, okay. so again, to give it a little more concrete feel. I, I don't, you know, I can talk here forever, so you'd better tell me when to shut up. Uh, but I can, can show you like how we do, uh, let's see, where do I want? Uh, da, 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 da. Samples, hello. There's a bit of a problem here that this window is too small for me to do anything with. Yeah, I don't think it works that well. Huh. Uh, let's look at, let's try and find Apple Forth anyway. Okay, Apple Forth. This is a class, and I was playing with it for various reasons, but uh, so you notice these little guys, they're really going to be hard to see, these little links up here. They, one of them says deploy, okay. and then if I press the menu, I have various ways of deploying it as a web page, you know, various, various things that potentially may or may not work. But the idea, the, the, the point is that by convention, certain, certain classes are organized in a certain way so we can treat them as application definitions for something that we can then deploy. And really the key thing is that we have this method up here, package using. So the, cons the factory for this guy, it's, it's not using platform and that, there was nothing special about using platform, it's just a name of a method on the class object that lets you, that acts as a factory. Uh, and so package using, by convention, that is, is, is a convention, that if, if, you, if your constructor says package using, we assume you're there to help us package an app. And we send it a manifest, right? When I said you pass it a map from a namespace that, should, that gives you basically the names of the different components you're going to have to put together. So that's the manifest. And, uh, Right. In this case, this particular thing, all it really needs is the, the, this module called Browsing for HTML, which is a class that basically implements a subset of the ID that runs in the, in the web browser. Not all of this runs in the web browser because it's damn hard to get the web browser to do anything civilized. But uh, it does do some things, and that is really what I need here in order to package it. And what it does with it is here is the main method. We can throw out these changes. They're not important. But 
the idea is that when conceptually when you start an app, a Newspeak application, you're going to call a main method. That's not a very alien concept, um, right? And in this case, it's main colon args colon. So main colon, it, we want to get the platform of the actual runtime we're executing on, not the platform we had when we were developing because I don't have access to the platform. I have this module. It has no external namespace. I'm going to need the platform to actually run the thing and to, to get anywhere. And anything else except the platform, I'm going to have to package into this, this object. So it'll have it when, it when it actually gets created at runtime, when I, I deploy this as, as a binary, as a web page, whatever that information should be in there. But the, the, the platform, I don't want to carry the platform in every, every binary. Right? If you think of it, uh, what's a good example, right? So Java doesn't have this problem. Everybody assumes there's a Java runtime around, and so you can deploy, deploy your jar file, and it has a bunch of class files in it, but they don't include the whole bloody Java platform. Otherwise, you'd really be in trouble. And similarly, we, we accept the platform is something we will the, we'll provide you when you start running the program, but everything else that, you're, that actually your module depends on that isn't in a, expected in a standard platform, you'll package up here. In this case, the only thing we needed was one module, but we could conceivably have more. We extracted them from the manifest. So what will happen is in the IDE, I will be able to get a namespace from the IDE, pass it as a manifest argument to this thing, and therefore I will get in instantiated as an object that has access to this class. And then you know, the system has enough information to figure out how can I now transform it into JavaScript or into various formats that we can deploy in. Now, when I run it, basically the system at least conceptually starts by let me call main and pass the platform object, and then you can decide how to configure your app. So I'm going to instantiate the browsing for HTML module, which needs the platform. So what I'm doing here is this guy is in my scope. When I serialize it, I serialize this class with it. And so I can actually get at it, instantiate it with platform, and I store it. And then uh, I'm actually using a nested class that I have here that's also part of the app, and it needs a browsing object that I created here. So I've configured an object that really does what it's thing. It has a couple of methods that ne it needs to, to start initializing it to do its thing. And it basically, this is, you know, in a simple case, you could just say run. Right? Assume that, that you had a generic method run that, that, that starts up the app. Right? So Main is a standard API to start doing this, and then the APIs of the different modules come into play as you compose the modules into something you want to do. You can probably find a more elaborate one that might illustrate this better. Uh, the point is that this thing, once you give it the manifest, we basically can instantiate and we have an object. And deployment is a matter of serializing the object in some format. And ideally, in a civilized world, we literally have a we do have a serializer, but no one cares about that format. But you serialize this thing, and bringing up the app is deserializing. The binary is a serialized object. You deserialize this object, and you call main on it, and that's your application running. That's really all it boils down to. That is what all the scenarios for deployment actually boil down to, except the binary object might the, the object may be called a.out or something else. But it is an object, and you, you, there's a standard API for making it you know, making it come alive. Often a main method, a procedural API. It's just in Newspeak, it's completely clear that that's what it is because it isn't confused by layers of terminology and obfuscation. So, in particular, one full way to serialize this object is as a bunch of JavaScript code. And when you do that, you can run it on a web browser. In that case, you typically will serialize it with the platform because the web browser doesn't have it built in, right? And we can, you know, this, this will bring up a subset of this ID that you're seeing here in a web browser that still can do interesting things like edit methods and, and uh, navigate and, and evaluate objects and things. Uh, but it can't do everything. And then if, if it is generalized to JavaScript, then what is security model? Because if it is JavaScript, you can access Okay, so, yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm not in the business of miracles. There are armies of people worrying about the browser security model. You know, all I can guarantee you is that, you know, you, uh, you know, from Newspeak code, you can't do anything bad. Once you run with, with any kind of native platform, whatever it is, your security is only as good as that native platform's security. If you run on C and you have an FFI to C, you're dead. There is no, 
uh, whatever people tell you, right, the idea that, that, say, something is secure, if it's making native calls, there's nothing to talk about, really. So JavaScript, at least, is in the browser, and there's a, a serious security model. But obviously, if uh, we're running in JavaScript, and if we call out to standard JavaScript things, and they're malicious and, and start to muck, then they can do whatever oh, they want. I mean, security is like separation between different classes and objects written in Newspeak. Uh, so it's essentially, this, the, the code is, is Newspeak code. It's been compiled into essentially a format that, of course, the, the, if you know the format the compiler is using and you have JavaScript code again, but if you don't have JavaScript code, the Newspeak code can't do anything that it couldn't run in, do in this environment, right? It's still talking through these interfaces. We enforce access control dynamically in the semantics of the JavaScript translation just the same, mm -hmm. right? So, so nothing has really changed from that perspective. But if you have a, a nasty JavaScript routine that goes, mucks with things, you know, that, then there's no solution to that. <laughs>